Imagine that there is a price oracle. This price oracle might be one essential component of a DeFi protocol. An authorized user will be able to update the price stored in the price oracle. But sending transactions to the price oracle to update the price can be costly. So the price oracle might have another contract called gas refund. This contract will refund for the majority of the transaction cost. It will calculate the amount of gas that was used to update the price oracle and then refund the amount of gas back to the user. This is a common pattern seen in DeFi protocols. An authorized account will send some transaction to do some task and in return it gets a gas refund. Here is a simplified version of this pattern. We have contract A and contract B. Let's say that a user calls into contract A, calls the function F. Inside it, it first calculates the gas left, called gas start. And imagine that over here there will be some kind of computation, some code. For example, this code might be to update the price oracle, or it might be to do some other task that is required for the protocol. And at the end of the code, it will ask another contract to refund for the transaction cost. It will send the receiver of the gas refund and the amount of gas at the beginning of this transaction, gas start. In this example, I call the function G. Contract B will be like the gas refund contract. Inside contract B, there's a function called G. It takes in two parameters, receiver and gas start. This function will refund gas to the receiver. The way it calculates the amount of gas to refund is it first takes gas start. Next, it calculates the amount of gas that is left, gas now, and then send the difference over to the receiver. Here we assume that this contract has enough ETH to send refund. This function shouldn't be a public function that any user can call. If any user was able to call this function, then they can set the gas start to a high number and then set the receiver to their address and just drain out the ETH that is locked inside this contract. Hence, this function must only be called by an authorized account. In this example, we'll set it up so that only contract A will be able to call into the function G. Calculate the amount of gas used from gas start to gas now take the difference and send the refund over to message.sender from calling the function f. But there is a bug in this contract, inside contract b, that allows any user to drain ETH that is locked inside this contract. Take a moment to see if you can spot the vulnerability. Okay, let's go over the problem. The bug lies in this part of the code. You might be thinking that there is no bug here, but let me explain. To understand the bug here, we first need to understand what's called 6364 gas rule. So what is the 6364 gas rule? What it says is that the external calls will receive a maximum of 63 out of 64 of gas left in the current contract. The remaining 1 64th of gas will be kept in the current contract. To show you an example, let's go back over here. Let's say right before the external call to the function G is called, there is let's say 100 gas left. To keep the math simple, we'll use small numbers. The 6364 rule says that 63 divided by 64 of the gas will be sent. So this will be 100 times 63 divided by 64 gas. That is the amount of actual gas that will be sent to the call to the function G. When the function G is called, let's say over here, this will be the amount of gas that will be sent. And the remaining 1 64th of gas, 100 times 1 divided by 64 gas. This will be kept here until later use, if there is any later use. And if it's not used, then it will be refunded to the message sender. So that's what the 6364 gas rule says. Now, how can this part of the code be exploited with this rule? Well, if you do the math, then it becomes obvious. So let's define three variables. We'll say G0 to be the call to gas left, the value that we get from calling the function gas left somewhere inside the code of contract A. And G1 will be call to gas left, the value of call to gas left somewhere inside the code of contract B. And to make this concrete, let's go up to see where G0 and G1 might be. Okay, so G0, this will be over here. In this example, G0 will be over here. We call gas left to get the amount of gas left at this point. And then G1, where's G1? G1 will be over here. This will be G1. The amount of gas left inside contract B when we call the function gas left. Okay, so now we have G0 and G1. And let's say G star is the actual gas left immediately before call to B. In our example, immediately before this part of the code is executed, what is the amount of gas left? We'll label this as G star. And here's a diagram. Somewhere inside the code of contract A, we measure gas theft. We label this as G0. 
Contract A makes an external call to contract B. Right before it makes an external call, there is, let's say, G star amount of gas left. According to the 6364 rule, the actual amount of gas that will be sent to contract B is 63 divided by 64 times G star. And afterwards, inside contract B, when we measure the gas left, we'll call this G1. Okay, so with that in mind, let's calculate the actual amount of gas this call used from between G0 and G1. What is the actual amount of gas that was used? So earlier, this code would say that the actual amount of gas used is G0 minus G1. When we calculate the actual amount of gas that was used, you'll see that this is incorrect. And to see this, let's call DG the amount of gas used between G0 and G1, the actual amount of gas that was used. Naive approach will be to say, just take the difference of G0 and G1, G0 minus G1. But actually, this is incorrect. And this is because 1 64th of G star will be kept inside contract A. The actual amount of gas that was used, we can break this problem into two parts. What is the actual amount of gas that was used inside contract A? And what is the actual amount of gas that was used in contract B? In contract A, it used up G0 minus G star. From the time G0 was called up until the time the external call was made to contract B, the difference would be G0 minus G star. At the beginning of the call to contract B, it had 63 divided by 64 times G star amount of gas. When it measured again at G1, that is the amount of gas that is left. So we need to add these two differences. The difference from G0 to G star. That's the amount of gas that was used between G0 to the point where it made an external call to contract B. Inside contract B, when it first received this call, it had 63 divided by 64 times G star amount of gas. When it measured the gas amount again, it had G1. The difference will be the amount of gas that was used inside contract B. Add these two up, and this is the actual amount of gas used between G0 and G1. We can simplify this equation. This will be G0 minus G1. And then here we have minus G star, and here we have plus 63 divided by 64 G star. The difference will be minus 1 over 64 G star. So this is the actual amount of gas that was used between G0 and G1. In contrast, over here, it's going to refund for G0 minus G1. So now let's put these two together. The problem with the code above is that it refunded for G0 minus G1. But the actual amount of gas that was used is given by this equation. Taking the difference, you can see that it overpays by 1 over 64 times G star. So that's one part of the problem. How can we use this fact to exploit the contract and then drain all of the ETH from contract B? The other fact is that G star can be large by having the user send a lot of gas. Remember G star, all of these numbers, G0, G star, and G1, all depend on the initial amount of gas that was sent by the user, since they all measure the amount of gas that is left inside the transaction. Hence, G star can be large simply by sending a lot of gas. Okay, so let's put these two together. In the current code, the caller can receive an overpayment of 164 times G star. And if we send a lot of gas, this number will be high, which means that we can drain contract B by sending a lot of gas. Let me show you this. Let's deploy these two contracts. I'll first deploy contract A and then deploy contract B. Next, we'll set up authorization. We'll only allow contract A to be able to call into contract B. So I'll copy the address of contract A, paste it here, and then set this equal to true. Okay, the next setup is to send ETH into contract B. So let's send one ether, one ether to contract B, and then hit transact. Okay, and now notice that there is one ether locked inside contract B. Now let's call the function f and try to drain ETH out of contract B. I'll first copy the address of contract B and then paste it in here. First, let's not send a large amount of gas. Let's make sure that the call works successfully. So I'll call F and the transaction was successful. And if I call it multiple times, you can see over here that the amount of beef locked inside contract B decreases, but it decreases slowly. Let's see what happens when we increase the amount of gas that we send. So for the gas limit, I'm going to set it to custom and then I'm going to just put this large number. And then let's try calling the function f again. And notice that it immediately decreased by 0.1 ETH. And if I call it multiple times, you can see that the amount of ETH locked inside contract B drains really quickly. So that is the exploit. Now how do we fix this exploit? 
The fix will come from correctly accounting for this 164 G star amount of gas that was never used. And to do this, we'll first derive some inequalities. Let's start with the obvious. We have G0. This is the initial amount of gas left that was recorded. And then we have G star. What is the relationship between G star and G0? Well, we know that G0 is called before G star. So the amount of gas left, G star, must be less than or equal to G0. And the actual amount of gas that will be sent inside contract V is 63 divided by 64 G star. So we have another inequality. 63 divided by 64 G star is less than or equal to G star. Okay, and then how does this compare with G1? Well, this is the actual amount of gas that was sent to contract B. And somewhere inside the code of B, later on, we call gas left to calculate the amount of gas left. This is G1. 63 divided by 64 G star comes before G1. So G1 will be less than 63 divided by 64 G star. Now let's simplify this inequality. We don't need this G star. Now when we divide this inequality by 63, you'll notice that we get this part of the equation. So this will be divided by 63, divided by 63, and this will become 1, and then divide this by 63. With this inequality, now we can find another inequality for this expression. First, we can flip the inequality by putting the minus sign, and then we can now add this number, g0 minus g1. Since g0 is going to be greater than or equal to g1, this will be a positive number. When we add it to this inequality, this is the inequality that we'll get. Okay, and now notice this part of the inequality exactly matches the equation for the amount of gas that was used between g0 and g1. So we have two inequalities that we can use to approximate the actual amount of gas that is used between G0 and G1. We have this equation and this equation. Which equation can we use to approximate the actual amount of gas that is used? Well, let's start with the right side. This is equal to G0 minus G1 minus G0 divided by 63. This is equal to 62 divided by 63 times G0 minus G1. If you think about it for a second, this number can be a negative number. Since if G0 is really close to G1, then 62 divided by 63 of G0 might be less than G1. There's a possibility that this part might be less than 0. Okay, how about this part? Well, if we can guarantee that this part is greater than or equal to 0, then we know that this part will also be greater than or equal to 0. And we can conclude that this part is actually greater than or equal to 0, from the way we derived the equation for the amount of gas used between G0 and G1, which was equal to this, and which simplified to this equation, which is exactly equal to this part of the equation. So we conclude that this part is greater than or equal to 0, so this part will also be greater than or equal to 0. So now, this is the equation that we will be using to approximate the actual amount of gas used between G0 and G1. Okay, so going back up, let's say the fix to this code. The fix to draining ETH out of this contract is to say, let's go back down, copy this equation, and then paste it here. G0 minus G1 minus G1 divided by 63. In this code, G1 will be gas now, and G0 will be gas start. So this will be minus gas now divided by 63. This is the fix. Let's try deploying this contract. I'll hit Ctrl S to compile the contract and remove the old contract B. We'll redeploy contract B again. And then you'll need to do the setup again. Authorize contract A. And let's also send one ETH into this contract. Okay, now this contract B has one ETH. Next, let's call the function F on this new contract B. Copy the address of contract B, paste it here, call the function f, and the transaction is successful. Now let's try sending a lot of gas again to see if we can exploit this contract. Again, I'll send this amount of gas. Okay, and then call the function f several times, and you can see that the amount of beef that is left inside this contract doesn't decrease so quickly. Hence, we can no longer drain ETH from this contract. So in this video, I showed you an example of a 63-64 gas rule exploit and how you can mitigate the problem.